Uh, our first speaker here is uh, Gabia Enchute from Tustin Narvai. And today she will be speaking about something very useful because she's a very organized, well organized activist. <laughs> so she will talk about how to organize our time and energy in a very efficient way. Uh, let's invite, uh, let's invite, let's welcome Gabia and give her yeah, some applause. Thank you, Alice. A disclaimer, I'm not that organized exactly, but I try and I already see some results and I want to share with you the techniques that help me, like the least organized person on the planet, to finally get on a better track and actually do things. Okay, so um, let's see what, what ways we have to be effective. I, will, I would like to talk about this today. So. We know that uh, the effect equals time times effort that we give some task, right? So if we have less and less time and, and if we are more and more busy, that means that we cannot really increase the time that we devote to a task uh, or a question, but we can increase the effort. We must increase the effort to, to get the same effect. And in, even if you are not exactly... Uh, if you don't exactly feel great about uh, effective altruism and the, the way of doing things in this movement, perhaps you have some other ideas, but you still want to be time effective, right? You want to, to be very economical with your time and be able to do things efficiently and, and in a fast manner. So uh, when I say being effective, uh, that's what I mean in, in this context. So Carl Newport, and I'm going to quote this guy a lot in this presentation, uh, says that two core abilities for thriving in the new economy, by which he probably means uh, the internet economy, the global economy, uh, are quickly mastering hard things, learning really fast, and producing at an elite level in terms of both quality and speed. So I don't really know about elite now, but let's say just a at a pretty good level. So this is the idea for, for a successful career, for being successful professionally and earning a lot. But as people who actually exploit animals are very efficient and very professional about it, we cannot afford anything else but be equally professional and serious about what we do. So I think that this uh, career oriented uh, philosophy applies to our work. So uh, I'm going to speak today about shallow work and deep work and what these terms mean and in, in one context we can use them to, to serve our activism. And later I would like to, to share the techniques that help you focus on, on deep work and, and get more quality out of your work. We will kind of zoom in on that. So what is deep work? Deep work can refer to the manner of working, which is a really focused manner, right? And the types of tasks that you do. So time spent times intensity of focus uh, equals high quality work produced. So what is this effort that we put in when we don't have much time? It is focus. It is our attention. And here's a nice quote that I thought is kind of inspirational. So when we have very little time to focus on something, we want to focus very deeply and, and produce the best possible result. And what is shallow work? Now, I was wondering if, when was the last time, and if you remember the last time, when you were really, really fully concentrated on, concentrating on something for a long time, and you managed to do that relatively easily. Can you please raise your hands, the people who do remember this experience, like more than for half an hour. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see we have a lot of successful activists. So that's very, uh, that's very good news. Um, but just try to imagine focusing on something for a really long time, like two hours, something really hard, something very challenging. And what usually happens in the nowadays world is the beepings and bleepings of our appliances, the notifications coming in, emails streaming in, calls and text messages coming, right? And, and, this, and even if nothing really comes, the sudden urge to actually find out something about today's news or go on the internet and check something, and we switch between tabs and tasks and we multitask. So what's shallow work? So first, a disclaimer uh, should be that shallow work is not unimportant, but I'll talk about that more. So uh, shallow work may refer to the distracted and focused manner of working, 
And multitasking is a, is a prime example of shallow work. And most of the multitasking, let's, let's face it, happens on the internet. <coughs> And also distracting secondary tasks as opposed to the kind of work that is the most important and often the most difficult. So shallow work is not something that we totally don't need. I'm not saying that. And in some cases, it might be the work that you need to do most. It depends on what you do and what type of activism you do and what your work is. But what I'm saying is that shallow work changes the way we think. When all the work that we do is shallow, when all the work that we do is in the, in the form of uh, multitasking and being online, we find it harder and harder to focus on something and work really deeply. So uh, what are the problems with shallow work? Shallow work and being online a lot and getting distracted a lot actually physically alters our brain and changes the neurocircuitry that we have. So first of the problems with shallow work is that the attention residue phenomenon which is uh, when you switch from task A to task B, your attention doesn't immediately follow. There's a lag of attention in what you do. So, and it gets even worse if you didn't finish the task that you were doing before you switched to another. So this really decreases our ability to focus. Another problem is less understanding of the bigger picture and the meaning. And I would like to illustrate this with a, with a really interesting study that happened in the US. So there were two groups of people presented with a puzzle. They, they were engaged with a task that they needed to do, and they were also wearing headsets that were making beeping sounds at irregular intervals. And both groups were initially told to just ignore the sounds and just focus on the task, and they were very successful in finishing it, and, and they both, the both groups uh, had very successful results. But then, after some time, they were given another puzzle, which was at uh, the same level of difficulty, but a different puzzle. And one of the groups was also told to actually count the beeps as they do the puzzle. So that means they had to focus on two things. And what happened is both groups ended up ended the task, they finished it successfully, but when they were asked questions about the task, the group that had to also count the beeps couldn't exactly remember very well what they did in the task uh, to such detail as the other group could. And they couldn't really explain what they learned from doing the puzzle. They couldn't put it into context and, and see the deeper meaning of the task that they did. And can you imagine how this works when we multitask, when we focus on activism? Can you imagine what effect this could have if we don't see what our task means in the, bright, in the broader context of what our work? So uh, the third and probably the most menacing um, reason why I say that um, shallow work could be bad for your brain if you only engage in shallow work, is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is a quality of our brain to change itself. So neurologists say that our brains keep changing to, the, to our very death for all our lives, and our mental processes and the things we focus on and the ways in which we work actually physiologically alter our brain and rewire the neurocircuitry in our brain. Uh, which means that the job that the type of work that we do gets easier and easier for us to do, and the type of work that we neglect gets harder and harder to focus on and, and perform. So, mm, internet is something that has been designed to be addictive. And internet is something that is engaging, is repetitive, is very visual, and, uh, and provokes a, an emotional response. So, if your job doesn't exactly 100% require being on, spending a lot of time on internet, just consider doing different types of work and alter between deep and shallow work. So the secret to outstanding results would be doing as little shallow work as possible to still be operational, unless your type of work is the work that demands you being distracted all the time and multitasking, while doing as much deep work as you can. And here's a, another disclaimer, is that four hours of deep work a day may be a healthy limit and may be only possible to people who are really, really trained at focusing all of their attention for four hours a day. So two hours or one hour of deep work a day might already be very, very good for a person who's not a, uh, who hasn't been an academic for many years, say. And you also certainly don't want to do two hours straight. You want a break in between that. But still, doing deep work could be very, very good for your brain. 
So if deep work is so successful and gets, uh, helps us get results, why is it not uh, encouraged in our society? Why do we get distracted in open offices talking to our colleagues and, and doing all types of work that is not exactly deep? So there are three, re there are more reasons, but I picked out several that I thought were the most prevalent. So the path of least resistance. Shallow work is the type of work that is easiest to do in this society. So it's kind of a self-perpetuating uh, cycle that we do shallow work and then we find it more and more difficult to do deep work. So then we look for justifications and ways to do more shallow work and not engage in deep work because it's getting increasingly difficult for us to do and that's how it goes. Uh, also, there's this um, outlook on technology that we have in our society, which is new equals good and equals that we need to use it. There's, that's the kind of attitude towards technologies that we always have. And the constant connectedness is viewed as a good thing, as something that helps us work, right? But it's, it might just not be so. So please consider um, every new technology that you are suggested and every new app with a very critical eye and see if you really, really need it that much. Okay, so the third reason is deep work demands self-reliance. That means that many people resort to busyness as proxy for productivity because it's easier to get small tasks done and have the sense of achievement uh, instead of focusing on something that's going to take really, really long time and a lot of hard focusing to achieve. Even, even if, it's, if that's way more important, we still tend to uh, try not to... <laughs> focus on that. <laughs> so uh, if you decide that you want to change the way you work and incorporate deep working habits in, into, your, uh, into your schedule, then a good idea uh, of what to do is to tell your colleagues that you're going to do so. Because if you, for example, work in an open office and you suddenly proclaim that you need to go and find a separate space to work so that no one really disturbs you. This might sound very arrogant unless you explain why you want this and why it's important to your work and why it helps your results. So um, it's our responsibility to kind of popularize this uh, type of work in, in our companies and organizations by like uh, telling our colleagues about the benefits of deep work. They can yeah, certainly if, even if no one else is doing it, but, but you feel it's important for your results, you can still find ways to do it. Okay, so um, let's talk about habits and how to foster the habits that we need to stay most productive and be able to focus deeply. So I'm going to tell about uh, the four main abilities that we need, four main things we need to do, and then I'll kind of zoom on to some of them. So the first and the most important thing is to decide what's really most important and devote the biggest portion of our time to that. We have to look at our schedule very, very critically and see if we are really devoting the most portion of our time to the most important things or are we just doing random tasks instead of that. Another ability we want to have is the ability to fully concentrate and keep our keenest attention intensively focused on something that we do on just one thing, and also to not turn away from something difficult or challenging, but just stretch our minds to the limit until we crack this question that we're working with. And I promise if you really, really work on this and if you really, really concentrate for a long time, even the most difficult task is going to give in. So it can be very challenging, but it's worthwhile. And fourth of the very important abilities is the ability to rest, to just wind down, be idle, because studies show that people who were uh, concentrating on very difficult issues and then had a walk in the forest afterwards and just relaxed and didn't think much, later came up with much better decisions than control groups that didn't have the opportunity to really win down while working on something. So let's kind of zoom in on the number two and number three, the, the ability to focus and the ability to do something for a long time and not really turn away. I have this nice graph here. <laughs> so first of all is uh, schedule your time with precision. It's uh, very, very important. And I really, really suggest it. Just try scheduling your day, even one day, as an experiment. Like almost minute to minute, at least 15 minutes uh, 
precision, kind of precision, right? So it doesn't mean that you need to really stick to it no matter what happens, even if the, if the house is on fire. That means that you need to reschedule if something unexpected happens, or maybe you need to kind of account that, kind of leave some time for something unexpected to happen as you plan, right? So you can readjust your schedule at whichever point in your day, but you need to schedule. You cannot just give in and say, yeah, that's all right, I just deviate from my schedule. Because that won't, will, not really, um, will not really help you kind of work on these skills of scheduling and planning and following that plan. So you can change your schedule as necessary any number of times a day, but you need to have a schedule. And, devote, and devoting some time on scheduling things is really worthwhile. So uh, embrace boredom does really not sound <laughs> impressive and inspiring, does it? But what this means is that not getting distracted, not going on the internet at first impulse is very, very important on reworking your brain into the kind of brain that can stay deep and focused. So that means that your time online should be carefully parceled and consciously planned. Say you decide that you're going to stay online like every for one hour and then you're going to work offline for one hour and you just repeat this pattern. And, and you try to continue that even in your leisure time. Um, okay, so then building up rituals for immersion. So that means finding out techniques that help you focus. For example, I have this particular uh, ribbon that I like that I kind of tie my hair with it when I sit down and work. Like, okay, look, I now tie my hair and now I'm really focused. So it's not like that ribbon really does anything, but it's just I come to associate deep work and this need to focus with this process of tying a ribbon in my hair, right? So you can find out any kind of... Uh, ritual that's meaningful to you, maybe just making a mug of a really nice tea or, I don't know, just looking out of the window for several minutes and then focusing on what you have to do and so on. So you'll work out your own ritual, I believe. Um, and then let's kind of focus even more deeply on these three ways of doing deep work. So about scheduling your time, you have to find out ways to incorporate deep work into your schedule and not just to hope that it's going to happen sometime when you have the time, but really schedule the time and devote some time to it. So are you going to devote one week a month to deep work and not do anything else that week and get totally disconnected? Are you perhaps going to just uh, work a couple of hours a week really deeply on something that's most important? And what can be deep work? What are types of deep work? It could be writing an article, an academic paper, maybe doing a translation, or writing a post for your blog, or editing someone else's article, or maybe just taking really, really good pictures of animals, or perhaps just thinking. Also, walking and just thinking about something can be really, really the most important form of deep work. Perhaps you need to work out a strategy plan for a campaign. Perhaps you need to think how to how to do a good presentation <laughs> and but that means that you really really need to focus too and thinking can be one of the most important f forms of deep work so schedule your time schedule your online time and for example what do you do if there's something that you need online when you've started working deeply and you just switched everything off and turned off the, all the tabs and the internet that you have what do you do well you switch to a task that you can do without going online or perhaps you reschedule your next bunch of internet time and you make it happen earlier. Or perhaps you just try and really work without going online and finding the information that you need. You can find various wa ways to deal with that, but just try to not ruin this kind of online and on offline pattern that you decided for yourself to have. Even when you're having leisure time, you might want to go and read a book or go and exercise and not go online for an hour, right? The most important thing is that once we decide what kind of pattern of going online and being offline really suits us, we really have to follow it. So if you have this urge, this kind of almost addictive uh, need to actually go and check your Facebook, right? When you're, for example, standing in a queue, very boringly, and so on, you need to resist that. But we'll talk of that a little more in another slide. So now... Um, how do you actually schedule your time? So there are these four ways of uh, perfect execution of things. 
So think, the first one is really obvious, focus on the wildly important, which means cutting back on tasks that are also not so important. And also acting on lead measures is very important. So what is a lead measure and a lag measure? You might have heard of this already, but I'll repeat. Mm, for those who might not have read this, so it's lag measures is something that you actually want. For example, you're a Facebook manager and you want to have 6,000 followers, right? So having 6,000 followers is not a goal. Like you don't control this. This just happens. Your goal might be making 10,000 of Facebook posts that are highly shareable and are likely to give you those followers. So this is something that you can control, right? You can tell yourself that, okay, now I'm going to make in this and that time frame this and that amount of Facebook posts. And that will likely lead to me having the number of followers that I want. So working, focusing on lead measures is very important. Sometimes putting time into deep work can be a lead measure for you to achieve something that's very, very difficult and very seems very far off in the future. So you cannot really focus on the goal, on the result that you want, but you can focus on the time that you want to put into working on it. Another rule is that people play differently when they keep score. So that means if you have, say, a sheet of paper divided into weeks and days of your month, and you put, with, with bright red pen, you put ticks into boxes when you've, in, when you've worked deeply for an hour that day, that really helps to connect this visual result, right? These red ticks on your calendar with the result that you have, with, say, achieving something that you've been working on. So, and that motivates you to continue and put even more hours of deep work into it. And create accountability. So now, accountability is, of course, the form of uh, responsibility when you've promised someone you'd do something, when you've arranged with your colleagues that you would do something, when you've got an assignment from your boss or something. But you can also just create accountability for yourself. For example, decide that you're going to reward yourself in some way when you achieve a really, really large goal. Or just, you know, uh, write a journal and kind of account for all the hours of deep work that you've, did, you've done, and so on. So, more about embracing boredom. So, I already talked a little about internet use. But an example of this would be if you're tediously queuing, standing in a line, right? There's a line in Starbucks, it's taking forever, and you really just want to reach out for your phone and just look at it. Maybe you got a message from a friend and you'd be entertained. So this instinct to be entertained is an instinct to be distracted. You want to fight that. If you're in, a, if you're in this patch of time when you're scheduled to be offline, please just try and, and fight it. Just stay offline. Like Even if you don't succeed and you eventually end up kind of looking at the news on your phone, these 10 or 5 minutes that you fight the urge are very, very important. It's like beating an addiction before you actually give in and go and have a smoke or something. Your brain is actually growing. The synapses in the right parts of your brain are actually growing when you just focus on the here and now and you kind of persevere and focus on, on the time that you have here and now instead of getting distracted with your phone. So your brain is being physically rewired into the brain that can think deeply. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so as I said, it's very good if you continue your planned online and offline pattern, even in your leisure time. For example, I'm not talking about emergencies and things when you really need to call a friend because you've arranged to meet them and they're not here, so that's okay to use your phone or even internet for that, but just try to stay as much as you can faithful to this pattern of, uh, of being offline and online. And uh, try to stop using social media, but this is a big one, right? This is never going to happen in the animal rights movement. But um, I'm not saying quit Facebook here and now, but perhaps you can, for example, get Facebook Messenger and just use it for messaging your friends when you really need them. And not really just scrolling Facebook for hours when, when you don't really know what you should be doing instead. And perhaps there are forms of, face, of social media that you really don't need to use and don't really even enjoy that much. Perhaps you have Pinterest and Flickr and Tumblr and Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and something else. And perhaps you don't need exactly all of that. Perhaps you are going to stay on Facebook but quit all of the other forms of social media or really drastically reduce the time you spend on them. Perhaps Twitter is really important for what you do and perhaps you enjoy Twitter the most of out of all. And then you might consider wanting to leave 
Facebook or perhaps not really doing anything much there. So staying as much off social media as possible is very good because social media is like the epitome of the qualities of internet that make it addic addictive. Also, when you plan to stay online, just indulge. <laughs> Don't feel guilty about it. If you have a batch of time, when you decide that you will be distracted, you are going to binge watch that Game of Thrones, you know, season and just don't feel bad about it and just do it. Like if you planned it, if you scheduled it and it's the your choice of use of your time, it's perfectly fine. It's it's even it can even be good because you actually followed the schedule that you made for yourself and and you can rest. Okay, so that let's, now let's talk about those rituals. So I already told you about the ribbon <laughs> that I tied to my hair when I start, tried to stay deep and focus. Uh, but there are other things you might need to think of when you, when you try to form a ritual for you, to help your work. For example, where are you going to work and for how long? Is there a particular place that you can feel particularly focused in? Perhaps you want to go to a cafe or a library or a certain room in your office or a certain room in your home or, I don't know, any type of place. Perhaps if you want to just think about something, you want to have a walk in a very quiet park. Anyway, finding a good place to work, uh, a place that supports deep work is very good and very important. Another one is how you'll work once you start to work. You need to work out kind of a list, to-do list or a, or a plan for what you need to do today, right? What you're going to do once you focus, how you're going to work, so that you don't have to spend like precious time that you decided to devote to deep work just thinking like, what was I supposed to do? So what do I do now? Uh, another practical advice is support your work with whatever that whatever is necessary for you, really. Just uh, necessary materials and information that you've withdrawn online so that you can use it while you work on something. You c it could also be just having enough water, having enough oxygen in, in the room, uh, maybe doing a little stretching when you, when you are getting stiff, just sitting down and doing something, right? So just find ways to support your work and, and try to have everything you need close to you so that you can really fully focus and don't have to go anywhere. And uh, you can find more about all of this in the books that I presented here. I tried to show um, uh, all types of uh, covers they come in. Uh, I read these three books this year and I think they changed my attitude towards working and life a lot <laughs> in general. So Shallows is a very uh, scary and intimidating book, but I think it's very important to read for everyone who spends a lot of time online. And Deep Work is a little more optimistic and it just... Uh, says like, yes, it is true what the shallows say, <laughs> but you can deal with that. And there are ways to do that, to fight that and get your brain back. And The Power of Now is a little more of a philosophy or a spiritual book that just actually talks about the same things that Deep Work, the, the book called Deep Work does, but uh, in a slightly different tone. It says that you're a kind of master of now and the only thing that you really have is the current moment and you can't really control your future or the past, right? Only what you do right now. And so I really recommend those books and I have them in audiobook form, so if you want them you can come later and uh, ask me and I can transfer them into your laptop if you have one or send it to you. So I just wanted to finish with this uh, kind of bottom line idea <laughs> uh, that deep work is meaningful and it can be very important in your life and it can help you not just get better results and, and be an outstanding activist, it can also just make you happier because we are never as, we never really feel that much meaning and we never feel that much happiness when we don't really focus on what's happening right now, on the here and now that we really can control. So thank you for listening. Thank you.